This is Phil Copenman, and I'll be talking about safety performance indicators and continuous improvement feedback. As an overview of this talk, first I'm going to talk about life cycle approaches to autonomous vehicle safety. That's going to involve something different than the historical approach of assuming a perfectly safe production release. And I'll explain what that means, how we got there, and why that changes for autonomous vehicles. We're going to need to move to a life cycle adaptation model in which we use operational metrics as a basis for continuous improvement if we want to get acceptable safety. Part of this is going to be used safety performance indicators, SPIs. Those are metrics that measure whether or not the safety case is still valid. It goes beyond vehicle is acting unsafely, and it goes beyond dynamic risk management. It goes beyond runtime safety monitors and gets to the place where the ANSI UL 4600 safety standard goes, which is using SPIs to monitor the soundness of the safety case over the vehicle life cycle. Big changes are in store for safety engineering because of the advent of autonomy, and in particular, autonomous vehicles. Conventional software safety engineering works by doing hazard and risk analysis, for example, according to the ISO 26262 Functional Safety Automotive Standard, and by mitigating the hazards to achieve acceptable risk. In general, there's a convenient fiction employed here, which is assuming that you have perfect safety when you're deployed. Now, we know it's not entirely perfect, but the idea is if you think you're almost perfect or as far as you know you're perfect when you deploy, you can go at the safety engineering a certain way. One of the things that comes along with that is realizing that the scope of safety is significantly limited if you have a human operator present because you can delegate a lot of the control of hazards to the human operator. If there's something that's a loose end in safety that you didn't get quite right, a human operator is there to save the day. So you're depending not only on getting the safety engineering right, but also on delegating all the messy, loose ends, the unknowns, all those things you're not quite sure what to do about. You've got a human operator there, and the human operator takes care of it. What happens if the human operator isn't a human anymore? What if it's a robot? Now, this is a fun picture of a humanoid robot that actually did drive a vehicle for a short distance. But what we expect is the ability to drive the car goes into the car itself, giving us an autonomous vehicle with no need for a human driver. Safety for autonomous systems isn't about a notion that when you ship the vehicle, you're done, that's it for the life cycle, it's safe. That's not going to work for autonomous vehicles. You're going to have to look at change over the life cycle. Partly that's because machine learning based validation is immature. We're just not to the point where you can build a machine learning system and be absolutely certain it will be safe for its lifetime with life critical responsibility. We're just not there yet. But even if we were there, you'd have an additional problem that the environment itself is imperfectly understood. You don't know everything you're supposed to teach the machine learning system so that it can be notionally perfect at it. There's unknown unknowns, there's gaps in requirements and so on. Even if you were able to get the system perfect on the day you deploy it, even in a messy open world, that world's going to change the second you deploy, the next day, the next year. Things will change that your system isn't ready for, and so you're going to have to evolve to keep up with the changing world. When it comes down to it, you're going to have to, for safety, join security and end up doing constant system monitoring and constant system updates for both safety and security. Given security issues, it was already going to be that way for conventional systems. But once you add autonomous functionality, especially things like machine learning, there's just no way around it. We're going to have to keep evolving and adapting the systems over the system lifecycle. So the question is, how do you do that? Let's start by looking at traditional safety engineering. The heart and soul of safety engineering is looking for hazards and risks and mitigating them. You typically do some sort of hazard and risk analysis for a conventional system. You list all the applicable hazards. Well, what could go wrong in a car? Well, you could have um, a battery fire. You could lose control of steering. You could have a system where the cameras fail or the LIDARs fail, or there could be an unexpected object in the road. There's a long list of hazards of things that can go wrong that you need to deal with if you want to be safe. You characterize the resultant risk 
of each hazard, and you make sure that any hazard that is too risky is mitigated. You update the design, you limit the operational design domain of the system so it just doesn't operate in areas that you cannot control the hazards adequately, and so on. And you keep iterating. You find a hazard, you mitigate it, you find a hazard and mitigate it until the overall risk presented by the design is acceptable. And at that point, it's time to deploy. With conventional safety, you're done. If you know all the hazards and you mitigate them all, that's it. You're safe. Time to go, at least in a theoretically perfect world. There are many different techniques you can use to create this hazard list. You typically start with lessons learned from previous projects, although if it's a novel project, you may not have much on that. Use industry standards. And there are structured brainstorming and analysis techniques, failure mode and effect analysis, fault trees, hazard and operational analysis called HAZOP. Bring your own favorite approach. There are many different approaches. In this talk, we're not going to get deeply into them. But suffice it to say, there are structured ways that safety engineers have been working on for decades to try and find all the hazards so that you know what needs to be mitigated and mitigation techniques to do that. The presumption here with traditional safety engineering is that all hazards have been identified and covered before deployment. And along with that, that only works if you have a fully characterized operating environment. For industrial controls and things that happen inside a car, that might well be a completely reasonable assumption. But as soon as you get into detecting objects and events in the external world, the assumption that you actually understand the operating environment 100% becomes highly questionable. For novel systems operating in an open world, hazard analysis becomes a lot more difficult because there's no way to know you figured out all the hazards and there's no way to completely characterize the operational environment. Operating in the open world is a challenge because the real world does what it wants. You can't tell it what to do and what not to do. It's going to do what it wants. You don't know all the hazards at first. Think about if you're trying to characterize different objects you would see in the external world. How do you know what all the objects are? Well, the objects are what they are. You can observe, you can find some, but there's probably something you missed unless you have incredibly long observation periods. So you don't know all the hazards. What do you do? You test, you test, you test, you test some more until you've uncovered enough hazards. From a process point of view, what it looks like is you have a design cycle that does the hazard analysis up front. You then go into testing. And once you're testing, you find surprises, things you didn't think of in the design. That process tends to be called dealing with the safety of the intended function, SODIF. So the idea for regular design and hazard analysis, which is called functional safety usually, functional safety is about something that breaks inside the system that you're going to fix. Safety, the intended function, is about interacting with the real world. Sometimes things don't operate 100% perfectly, like if there's a radar, sometimes you get a pulse back, sometimes you don't. But more importantly for our purposes, there are requirements gaps. So you operate in the real world, you look at the unknowns, which manifest as they're called triggering events. So ISO 21448 is the automotive standard for SODIF, which will say operate until you encounter something you haven't seen before, an unknown unknown. And then when that happens, it's a triggering event. Feed it back into your design. Do the hazard analysis now that you know that's a hazard. Mitigate it and then repeat until you stop seeing triggering events. That's great if you stop seeing triggering events, but what if they keep coming? So this is a little bit of a problem. Nonetheless, this is the approach being taken by many of the autonomous vehicle companies. They're going to go out and they're going to test until they've covered all the things that matter, and that's the set of process. The limitation to this is the residual unknown unknowns. You've driven for 1,000 miles, 100,000 miles, a million miles, 10 million miles, but at some point you stop seeing new things you haven't dealt with, and when that happens, you can say it's time to deploy. So the hypothesis behind the SOTIF approach is that you can find enough of the unknowns to get yourself to safety. And if that works, SOTIF will get you there. If it doesn't work, we're going to have to be more careful. And a lot of this talk is how to know that it's working and what to do about cases where it might not work as well as you want it to. Let's say you have a driver assistance system. This is a system where automation helps the driver. For example, the automation might be doing lane keeping to keep the driver in the lane, but the driver is still responsible for overall safety and still responsible in particular for mitigating any hazards that the system can't deal with. 
The feedback model for that system looks like what we've seen so far. There's hazard analysis done on the design. There's a set of triggering event feedback system. But when you deploy, the only thing that's helping mitigate problems when you deploy is driver experience. What you have is the driver, the human driver, doing dynamic risk mitigation. Now, this is a useful fiction. We're back to the useful fiction. Systems are presumed to be safe forever when released. And the reason you can get away with that is that the driver is up there cleaning up the mess if you didn't get it perfect. However, sometimes there's a problem with the system that it's unreasonable for a driver to mitigate. For example, if you have phantom braking, it might be, well be the case that the driver can't really effectively mitigate that quickly enough, or maybe even at all, and there could be a risk of being rear-ended by a heavy truck following. So there's an expectation the driver will help mitigate the risks and surprises, but there's a possibility that not every risk can be mitigated. What do we do about that? Well, we have recalls. So in any system, once it's deployed, there's a driver who is supposed to keep things safe, but when that is an unreasonable ask or the system is just too dangerous, we have recalls. These recalls are problems seen during deployment that go back and feed a design change and an update. It's not supposed to happen according to the safety model, but in the real world, it does happen. Nonetheless, if recalls are extremely rare, uh, certainly it's better to fix problems that you find out about by surprise than not. And every recall is a sign that the feedback system is working. So it's important not to punish companies for recalls if it was a reasonable thing that just there's no way anyone would have thought to avoid it. And it's important to have them as part of a healthy feedback system. So a question is, how effective is this recall feedback system? Remember, the idea is that some things drivers cannot reasonably mitigate. So if you have an unmitigated hazard, uh, possibly due to a design defect, it's really important to find those and fix them to maintain operational safety. But let's look at what happens in the real world. In a conventional system, it's far too often the practice that you ignore it if it's not reproducible. At some point, we've all heard in response to a software defect, something bad happened, your cell phone crashed, or your car did something funny, whatever, and you call to complain about it, and the first thing they do is they say, well, can you get it to do it again? Now, from a software engineering point of view, it's reasonable to ask to get it to do it again so you can take a look and investigate what happened. But if you're not able to reproduce it, they may just say, well, there's nothing we can do and ignore it. There's tremendous incentive, especially in automotive systems, to ignore a software defect that's not reproducible and basically pretend it didn't happen. Now, sometimes what happens is you get a defect that reproduces, but not too often, and there's a way to say, well, maybe it's a software defect, but maybe it's a human error. Or maybe the engine controller applied too much torque to the vehicle and the vehicle sped up when it should not have. Or maybe the human driver pressed the wrong pedal. I mean, who knows? So you blame it on the operator. It's easy to blame the operator because how's the poor operator to prove they didn't do something wrong? So you see the cycle in safety-critical systems. You ignore it if it's rare and not reproducible. If it happens too often to ignore, you blame the operator. And then when blaming the operator stops working, you say, well, we're going to fix it with education. We're going to train our operators on workarounds or mitigation. You see this especially in aviation, that uh, if the aircraft does something wrong, you say, well, the pilots are trained to deal with it, so we don't have to fix it. Okay, that works to a degree, but there's some things that can't really be worked around. So you try, again, to blame it on the operator for not doing the workarounds, and you only very reluctantly do a software update. For those of you who followed the Boeing 737 MAX issues that included two crashes of, of aircraft, you'll find that this is the cycle that was followed, and eventually they did do a software update, but only after trying to blame the operators and so on. This behavioral pattern happens in every safety critical area. It's across domains. And why does that happen? Why does it persist? Well, partly there's a power imbalance between the victims and the system designers. If there's an airplane crash, the people and their families who were affected by the crash don't have a lot of power to go up against the large airframe manufacturers. That's what the regulators are for. But there's also a normalization of a moral crumple zone strategy. This is especially bad in automotive. A moral crumple zone is when there's an equipment failure, you find the nearest human and you blame it on them instead. And you typically have a narrative, well, the person should have done this thing to compensate for the equipment failure. 
But it may be that it was unreasonable to ask that. And what you're really doing is just finding someone to blame so that you don't have to fix the problem. There's pervasive poor adoption of software engineering practices. Uh, it varies from domain to domain, but it's very common to see domain experts writing software who do not have a particularly rigorous software engineering education. And that is leading to a lot of questionable quality code that ends up sometimes in life critical applications. That's a persistent problem across many industries. And finally, one of the reasons that this pattern persists is that the feedback loop is called a recall. And recalls are bad, and, and they bring legal consequence, so we try not to do recalls. So just calling the feedback loop a recall is actually harmful in practice. One of the things you would hope from a recall approach, especially if you have a strong safety culture, is that recalls would drive quality improvement and change over time. So right now, we're doing a recall approach. How's that working out for us? Well, I spent some time, considerable time, going through National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA, recalls. So these are things that actually were proven to be a software defect that caused a safety problem. So this is a small sampling. There's a web page I'll cite at the bottom that has more than 100 of these. Uh, and the numbers at front 22V169 is the 169th recall in year 2022. Uh, this one is backup camera and display failures. There's actually a lot of them. That's just an example. There's a parking lock system error that leads to delivery vans rolling away when parked. And if you look on YouTube, you'll find some video of a delivery person chasing their van down the street. 21V873 and many, many others, airbags disabled. So this means there's a crash and the airbag does not go off. And the reason it did not go off is a software defect. There's phantom braking where a vehicle stops or panic brakes for no reason. Uh, in this case, due to an inconsistent software state after power up. There's battery controller reset disconnecting the electric drive motor power, meaning that you lose power on the highway, possibly with high-speed traffic behind you. There's an improper fail-safe logic that degrades braking performance. Your brakes don't work as well as they're supposed to. There's one that has a communication disruption that results in malfunctions of wipers, windows, lights, and so on. Reading the problem report, it sounds like the car acts like it's possessed or something. There's a bunch of them with airbags deploying too forcefully or deploying when they're not supposed to deploy. Again, these are all software defects, not the mechanical defects. There's one where the engine does not reduce power, so you take your foot off the accelerator and the car keeps going. There's one where an unexpected steering motion causes loss of control, and again, that's a software problem. And there are some where there's an unattended vehicle that starts its engine, for example, in your garage with the garage closed and ends up with carbon monoxide poisoning risk to the occupants of the house. There's a web link here with a list of more than 100 of these. The takeaway here is that the automotive industry has a software quality problem. These are all things that are software defects that made it out into the operational fleet and had to be recalled. What about autonomous vehicles? The defects I showed you were just for normal vehicles. Well, in autonomous vehicles, things are going to get it worse. And the reason is that machine learning is the heart and soul of a lot of these vehicles. And machine learning learns things that it has seen or that are somehow close to what it's seen. It learns by example. What we found is that machine learning can be brittle. Sure, if you learn one thing, you can generalize other things. But it is brittle in the sense that there are some dimensions along which small differences can result in big changes or if it sees something unusual, it just doesn't even know what it is. There can be spectacular failures for the unexpected, even if it's something that a person would say, oh, I know that's a dog or whatever it is, you can get completely random examples. And I'm, I'm having a little fun from the movies saying loaf of bread, but we've seen in operational systems that things are classified in ways that just doesn't make sense. Machine learning complicates safety engineering. Safety engineering assumes there's a thing called the V model where the V is you have the requirements and the design down the left of the V and the implementations at the point at the bottom of the V and then testing goes up the right hand side of the V. And it assumes that because that allows you to say, well, I know what I intended to build and my testing can prove that I built the thing I thought I was going to build. But if you're doing learning by example, the left side of the V is a problem because you don't actually know necessarily what you're building. You're saying, well, I don't know what a dog is. I don't know what a person is, but I'm going to train it by example and it'll figure it out. Well, how do you know it figured out the thing you think it figured out? That's hard. 
it breaks the V because you lack traceability to an articulated design. Machine learning is also prone to brittleness to unexpected data variations, and, and we've seen that be a problem in autonomous vehicle safety as well. You have to ask questions like, were there biases or gaps in the training data? And it might be something like um, the size or shape of, the, of a person, but it might be the color clothing they're wearing. It could be a lot of different things. And how do you do assurance for rare objects and events in the real world? Safety is often limited by rare, high-consequence events. They don't happen often, but when they happen, it's really, really bad. And if you have a system that assumes, well, all the stuff that matters is the things we see most frequently, that's sort of at odds. Clearly, there are ways to try and deal with this in machine learning, but the point is that this is a difficult spot that requires a lot of attention to try and get safety. As difficult as machine learning is to validate for safety, we have an additional problem that autonomous vehicles have to operate in an incomplete open world in which we do not have all the requirements. There are unusual road obstacles and conditions. Someone decided that taking a retired jet fighter would be pretty cool to have as a car. Well, that's a car, and it doesn't matter whether you expect it or not. If you're behind it on a highway, you have to deal with it. Now, somebody may say, well, I've never seen an aircraft on a road. It can't happen. But I've personally seen that. It turns out if you go to some military bases, there's a stop sign, but you're not stopping for the cars. You're stopping for fighter jets going from the hangars over to the runway, and it's your job to uh, stop and not hit them because I will assure you, your car insurance does not cover the cost of a brand new F-22. There are other things that are tricky. For example, if you see some water on the road, it's hard to know how deep it is. Uh, this human-driven vehicle found out the hard way. I think it's kind of impressive that the headlights are still on. Uh, but when you have some standing water, it's really tough. Now, humans have trouble with this too. There's no doubt about that. But if you have no human in the vehicle, the question is, will the autonomous vehicle do at least as well as in human these kinds of very difficult situations? There are unusual road configurations. Here's a roundabout of roundabouts. Uh, there's just the one called the magic roundabout, but if you're driving in that area, your vehicle has to know how to deal with it. There are also strange behaviors. You know, sometimes there's a person in a chicken suit running around, often selling fried chicken, uh, and you have to correctly categorize that as a pedestrian. Uh, it's not okay to hit the giant chicken with your car, even if it doesn't look like a person. And there are often subtle clues. For example, here, there's a person, there's a bicycle. Is that a person in a bicycle completely separate? Well, no, because the hand is intersecting with the handlebars. It looks like the person is holding the bicycle and pushing it. Okay, but is the person on the bicycle riding it or is the person a pedestrian? And I'm going to say because the feet are flat and both on the ground, it's more likely a pedestrian pushing a bicycle and therefore has to be treated as a pedestrian. Why does that matter? Well, the traffic laws are dramatically different, but also the expected thing that happens next is different. If it's a person on a bicycle, they could start moving quite quickly. A person walking next to a bicycle is probably going to have more trouble changing direction, more trouble getting out of the way if there's a bad event, but the person is probably going to move more slowly than someone mounted on a bicycle. One of the big challenges for deploying autonomous vehicles is that by all appearances, the real world has a heavy tail distribution of objects and events. Let's break down what that means and why that's such a big deal. Let's say that you're going to assume that you have random independent arrivals of weird things on the road, things that your sort of system hasn't yet trained on, hasn't encountered, triggering conditions that are going to break your system because you haven't trained on it, it's not part of your requirements, and so on. If you have an independent random arrival rate, things might not be too bad. You test and test and you get all the common things you see in testing and you say, that's okay, the things, the edge cases we did not see in testing are so rare, the area under the curve is so small, it's okay, we're acceptably safe. But here's the tough part. When you say that surprises arrive very rarely, that implies that you can retrain your system and handle all the area under the curve without testing all that much. But it isn't about how often surprises arrive. It's about the population of surprises that arrive. What if, even though surprises do not arrive often, every single time it's a different one? If you look at a different distribution, a power law distribution, often associated with the 80-20 rule, what you see is that for the same area under the curve, a lot of the population of the arrivals is shoved out towards the far end of testing time. 
that yellow space is the same area under the curve under the tail that was under the initial part of the curve for random independent arrival rates. So it's a heavy tail because there's a lot of the population way out at long testing times. If this is the case, trying to test on all the common things might not be enough because there's so many uncommon things you may not be able to prove safety using an iterated set of testing approach. Now that graph was pretty abstract, so let me try and show you in a more concrete way why the heavy tail matters. Consider if you want to test for 1 billion miles of testing. In the US, there's about one fatal crash per 100 million miles, and you may need perhaps a billion miles of testing to get statistical significance. And by the way, that number includes all the drunken impaired drivers, so that's a lower bound. You probably want to be better than that. But still, you're talking a billion miles of testing. Now the question is, if you do the billion miles of testing and fix everything you find, will that be safe enough in the end? Let's consider two examples. For the first example, let's say there's 100 surprises, and each surprise happens every 100 million miles. If you do the math, you'll see on average that's one surprise per million mile, but there's 100 different ones. Nonetheless, if you test a billion miles, you're going to see each one of those surprises 10 times, and you have a good chance of figuring out what it is and fixing it. Here's the rub. What if there are more than 100 surprises? What if there's a much larger number of surprises? For example, what's the predicted motion of this house? Is it a house or is it a vehicle? Is it both? Well, it kind of depends. If you spend a lot of time on the web looking at pictures of weird things on roads, you realize that it's going to be more than 100 surprises for a real vehicle. Let's run another hypothetical example just to illustrate what the problem is. Let's say instead of 100 surprises, there's 100,000 surprises. And each surprise only happens once every 100 billion miles. Because there's rare, there may be only one vehicle of a particular type out on the road, and you may not see it that often, and that's just the way it is. With this math, you're still going to see one surprise every million miles. But you're only going to see 1% of the total surprises after a billion miles. For the vast majority of situations, each surprise only gets seen once. And even then, you only see a small fraction of the surprises. In this case, fixing all the surprises you see doesn't help for safety. Because even if you fix 100 surprises or 1,000 surprises, you've only got 1% of the surprises fixed. That's just not going to get you there. So the difference between a random independent arrival and a heavy tail arrival matters not in how often you see surprises, but rather what the source of surprises is. And sadly, it looks like the real world is heavy tail. So this is a huge limit on the SOTIF approach to actually get you safe before you deploy. In the face of this, assuming you're going to be perfect when you deploy is no longer a useful fiction. It's just not going to happen. You can be pretty good. You can be pretty safe. You may be able to get to acceptably safe that it's OK to deploy in small numbers and get more experience. But you're not going to be perfect because even if you do a billion miles of testing, you're not going to see all the surprises that happen in the real world. And that means you cannot train your machine learning to deal with them. And you're going to have things that in a previous life would have been called a recall quite frequently. So we're going to need feedback measures from deployment to deal with this. There's no way to get this thing perfect at the time of deployment. We want it to be safe enough to be ethically responsible to deploy. But as to the fiction of that this system is going to be perfect, that's just not going to happen. Well, to do this, if you want to get feedback from the lifecycle, you're going to need metrics. And the question is, which metrics should you use? The classic approach for automotive metrics is key performance indicators, KPIs. And that's what you typically see. You see things like deviation from the intended vehicle path, ride smoothness, how often you get hard braking, how often you get disengagements during testing, meaning that the safety driver has to override the automation, the coverage of a defined scenario catalog. Here are all the possible geometries of vehicles, and did we think of all of them and test them? And risk metrics such as time to collision. Time to collision is if I don't do anything, how long until I collide? And you want to keep that number a lot higher than zero because that means you're not getting any near misses. Now, taken individually, each one of these KPIs can help you in the design process. But some of them are more closely related to safety than others. And the question is, how do you know which ones are predictive of safety? For example, hard braking incidents seems to be correlated with good and bad drivers' 
in human drivers, but it's hard to know what the causal relationship is, and it's easy to see exceptions or the ability to game that metric with an automated vehicle. So it's not clear that that's going to predict safety of automated vehicles very well at all. So how do you predict operational safety? Are KPIs good leading metrics for loss events? Some, but which ones? Hard to say. Does a particular KPI set cover all aspects of safety? Almost certainly not, unless you have a methodical way to evaluate coverage. And right now, KPIs are more, this is what we thought of, as opposed to, here's a methodical way to get coverage of safety. So the question is, how can we select KPIs for traceability to safety to make sure the KPIs actually predict safety and to make sure we haven't left something out of what we're measuring? A metric that specifically relates to safety is a safety performance indicator, SPI. I'm going to be using a definition compatible with the ANSI UL4600 Autonomous Vehicle Safety Standard for SPIs. For use with 4600, an SPI is a measurement used to measure or predict safety. There are lagging SPI metrics. This measures how it turned out, such as the arrival rate of adverse events compared to risk budget. So you might have a non-zero number of crashes per hour, but it should be a very low number. The SPI would measure how crashes are happening in terms of the allowable budget. And incidents. These could have been a loss event, except you got lucky and there was nothing there to hit, although something could have been hit if you're unlucky. For example, running a red light or traveling the wrong direction in a lane of travel. These are called lagging because it has to do with how the vehicle actually behaved on the road, which lags behind the design process. You also need leading metrics to predict safety. Leading metrics are things that can go wrong, but don't necessarily produce a crash. They're just a symptom of something's not quite right, and they should be predictive of eventually, if you keep doing that, you'll eventually have a crash. The question is, how do you take some measurement and know that it's a leading metric other than just by saying, well, it sounds like it might be? And the answer to that is, you link the leading SPIs to the safety case. Well, what's a safety case? A safety case for autonomous vehicles looks like this. There's a claim, it's a property of the system, such as the system avoids hitting pedestrians. There are one or more arguments. The arguments are why that claim should be true. For example, we avoid hitting pedestrians by detecting and maneuvering to avoid. Each argument is backed by either sub-arguments or evidence. In this case, evidence might be tests, analyses, simulations, and so on. So the idea is you have a claim argument evidence chain saying, here's why we think we're safe, and then here's the arguments and evidence to back that up. If you have something that's really complex, you're likely to have subclaims and arguments to address the complexity going claim, argument, subclaim, subclaim, sub-argument, sub-argument, all the way down to lots of evidence. So it's expected that a safety case can get fairly big and fairly complex. But ultimately, if you want to say you're safe, there should be a way to explain to someone else why you believe it's safe and what the evidence is to back that up. For a claim of we don't hit pedestrians, it would be perhaps we detect pedestrians and here's some evidence that's true. We maneuver around detected pedestrians and here's why that's true. And if for some reason we can't maneuver, then we're going to be able to stop and here's why that's true. Well, how do SPIs relate to the safety case? Here's the idea, the SPI's instrument, the safety case. Here's a safety case where I've only included the claims and I left out the arguments for illustration purposes. And let's say the top claim is the vehicle is acceptably safe. And that's because it avoids crashes and some other things. And it avoids crashes because it detects objects and some other things. Underneath it detects objects, there are some other things that sound a little less behavioral but are nonetheless important for safety. For example, for detecting objects, your sensors have to be effective or you can't detect objects. And one of the things having to do with sensor effectiveness is whether they're kept clean or not, because an optical sensor full of mud is not going to be able to see anything. And there also needs to be data fusion effectiveness, and that may have to do with the algorithm, but it may have to do with the implementation quality of the software, and it may have to do with the test coverage to validate the software, and so on. So a safety case is more than just here's the behavior. The safety case for a UL4600 application has to do with the entire life cycle of the vehicle, all the software, all the infrastructure that supports it, all that has to be in place to get safety, and the safety case needs to reflect that. Well, SPIs come in by monitoring the validity of the safety case claims. 
So an SPI is something that says, well, you said you were going to avoid crashes, but a crash just happened. So what's up with that? And it may be okay in terms of the safety case to have a crash as long as it was very, very seldom. So the SPI would collect data about how often crashes happen and compare that to a reference baseline that says, well, the vehicle is safe if it crashes hypothetically one-tenth as often as a human-driven vehicle. And you may say, okay, we had a crash, but over the fleet, the crash is happening only 10% as often as for human vehicles. So that SPI indicates we're actually doing okay on the safety case. In principle, every single claim in the safety case can have an SPI associated with it. Now, in practice, it's more likely it's a large number of claims that are spread throughout the safety case rather than literally every single one. But in principle, if you have a claim and you can figure out how to measure it, that's the opportunity to have an SPI. If you look at the structure and think about leading versus lagging, where lagging is outcome and leading is things we have predictive power, what you'll see is that SPIs towards the bottom of the safety cases drawn here tend to be more leading metrics and SPIs towards the top tend to be more lagging metrics. Leading versus lagging is not a strict categorization, but rather a spectrum of things that tend to be more anticipatory and things that tend to be more about outcomes in the operating environment. Now, let me give you some examples because the idea of an SPI may sound sort of abstract based on that. So let's give some examples and then give a little more rigor about what SPIs really are. Think about it at the system level, so it's sort of towards the top of the picture we just saw. A system level SPI would be road testing incidents were caught by a safety driver in testing. Uh, and if there are a lot of them, that means you still have a lot more work to go and, and you're not near safe. You really want to have no road testing incidents the driver has to intervene before it's time to deploy. And there might be some simulator software in the loop and hardware in the loop simulator incidents and so on. And part of the safety argument is that all these types of system level issues are so rare that it's okay to deploy. That means the SPI has to do with having extremely rare incidents, near misses, perhaps even collisions during testing and development to give you confidence that your system is safe. They're going to be subsystem level SPIs. Vehicle controls. Well, how often have you seen the vehicle stability compromised? You need a stable vehicle to be safe, and so loss of vehicle stability should be rare. If you lose vehicle stability, maybe you don't have a crash, but that doesn't mean it's okay. A loss of vehicle stability means that your claim that my stability control system will keep my vehicle able to maneuver might not be true, and so there should be an SPI to measure that. For path planning, one of the things you care about is that you leave some extra margin when going past a pedestrian. You don't want to be passing a pedestrian by one centimeter every time. If you do this, something will go wrong. So you may have a buffer and just simplifying, let's say you need to be no closer than one meter to a pedestrian when you pass by them in a certain operational scenario. Okay, but let's say you're consistently at 0.9 meters instead of one meter. Does that mean you hit someone? Probably not. But you have an issue that you said you proved you would never be close to the one meter, and here you are consistently at 0.9. Something's wrong. You don't understand safety, and if you don't understand safety, eventually something bad is likely to happen. For perception, you look at the false negative non-detection rates. For prediction, you say, well, there's unexpected object behavior. We kept predicting the following would happen, and we kept being wrong about it. So now I can't trust our predictions when I'm claiming safety. Those are the type of subsystem SPIs you would see are things where it's just not working as you expected. There are also life cycle SPIs. There are maintenance errors. There are invalid configurations. Sadly, those numbers won't be zero, but if you have lots of maintenance errors, that's going to catch up with you eventually and result in a loss event out on the road. Now that we've talked about some examples of SPIs, let me come back and give a more detailed definition of what an SPI really is. First of all, you've noticed that I'm pronouncing this SPI rather than saying SPI. I recommend you use SPI instead of SPI. Uh, and the reason for that is I used to say SPI, and then I met with some government officials in Washington, D.C., and they asked me quite seriously what the Central Intelligence Agency had to do with autonomous vehicle safety, and I realized what the confusion was. So I recommend you as well always use SPI rather than SPI. An SPI is a metric supported by evidence that uses a threshold comparison to condition a safety case claim. Now, that's quite a mouthful. But let me break it down for you. 
By metric, we mean a measurement of performance or design quality or process quality, operational procedure conformance, etc. Some metric that has anything at all to do with life cycle that is relevant to safety. There also needs to be a threshold, some sort of acceptance test on a metric value. Now, the notion of threshold here can be pretty loose. It can be an incredibly complicated function that computes whether or not the SPI value is in the safe zone or not in the safe zone. You know, that's okay. But ultimately, it boils down to some sort of Boolean comparison that produces a true or a false. So the idea is you have a metric, and the metric is either good or not good. The threshold is often statistical. It's quite common to have some sort of SPI threshold that of the form, well, X is bad, but the SPI violation threshold occurs when X happens more often than so many events per billion miles, for example. And this is important because a particular event, while maybe very undesirable, might still be acceptable if it's extremely rare. So for example, if you have a crash, Saying that you have a crash doesn't necessarily mean your system is unsafe in terms of acceptable safety. It's if crashes happen too often that you have a problem. The perfect system that never crashes hasn't been built yet and probably never will be built. So it's all about the statistical numbers rather than the specific behavior over a very short period of time. There's some evidence. The data is used to compute the metric. So you have data from evidence computing a metric, and that threshold comparison conditions a claim. So we're back to the safety case now. You've made a claim. We claim that such and such is true. And the such and such claim is not that it's true 100% of the time, but rather the claim is this is true to the degree that we get fewer than X undesirable events per billion miles, for example. So a threshold violation falsifies a specific claim in the safety argument, which means that the argument for that claim is potentially proven false by the SPI. Let me go back and look at that a different way. You have a claim. The following can never happen. But the SPI measures whether it actually happens. And if it actually happens, well, that claim must be false and something's wrong with your safety case. Anything that misses one of the above criteria is not an SPI. It's a KPI. In particular, if you have a KPI and you can't point to a specific claim in the safety case that is directly measured or potentially falsified by that KPI, then it's not an SPI. KPIs can be useful, but it's hard to relate them to actual safety outcomes. On the other hand, an SPI, by its very nature, is relevant to deciding whether your safety case makes sense, and that makes it some sort of indicator as to safety, or at least the validity of your safety case. The idea is if you have an SPI violation, part of your safety case is not as strong as you thought it was, and that should be a concern for safety. Now let's talk about how SPIs work with lifecycle feedback. The SPI is a direct measurement of a claim failure. So you have some sort of claim, and you have some reasoning saying, well, I believe that the claim X is always true. And the SPI's job is to say, well, you believed it was always true, but guess what? It's false now. There you are, deal with it. So the SPI takes its own measurements and measures whether or not the claim is false in practice as opposed to the nice theoretical world of the argument you presented. It's important to note that partial measurements are okay. An SPI need not determine every single possible way the claim can be false. It just needs to know at least one way the claim can be false. Because an SPI might be only a partial measurement of the claim, there are multiple SPIs for some claims. If there are three different ways that you can think of that the claim could be false and you can measure all three, that's great. If there's a fourth way, well, that's a lost opportunity, but that still means there's some sort of value in measuring the three ways you can figure out how to measure. If you have a falsified safety case claim, in other words, your SPI says, hey, guess what? You thought this claim was true and it just got shown false by operational experience. It does not necessarily mean you're about to have a crash. It could be way down in the details and you could have a very, very subtle violation. For example, you could say, well, I have a false negative rate of less than 10% just to pick up a number and your false negative rate is 10.1%. Does that mean all of a sudden all your vehicles are gonna crash tomorrow? You know, probably not, one hopes. But if you said it was less than 10 and it's not less than 10, then something's wrong with your safety case and you need to go figure out what's going on with it.
it means the safety case has some defect. An SPI evaluation, by definition, means your safety case has a problem. The root cause analysis might reveal, well, there's a product or process defect. There's an invalid safety argument. Maybe you just got the safety case wrong. Uh, there may be an issue with supporting evidence. There might be an assumption error, and so on. It might be that you just change the threshold a little bit and everything's okay, but you can't just change the threshold to make the problem go away. You have to have some sort of reason that changing the threshold makes some sense. For example, maybe you increase one threshold but decrease another so the net risk stays the same, but now the system is operating closer to what you expected. Now that we have safety cases in SPIs, let's take another look at the diagram of how different feedback can work in the automotive life cycle. The safety case argues acceptable risk, and the SPIs monitor validity of the safety case. You still have the hazard analysis and updating the design cycle that we saw for conventional vehicles. It makes perfect sense to mitigate all the hazards you can think of before you start operating, but we know there are going to be some hazards that either you didn't think of or that come into existence, they just evolve spontaneously in the real world after you release. During deployment, you're going to want a runtime safety monitor to help with runtime safety. Remember, with an autonomous vehicle, there's no human driver to mitigate risk if there's something you missed, so you want the runtime safety monitor. But just as importantly, you also want to use SPIs to feed back data to the safety case. So if there's a problem in design, there's a problem in testing, there's a problem in deployment, sure, go ahead and use the runtime safety monitor to take care of the immediate situation. But just as importantly, realize your safety case missed something, your safety case had a defect in it, use the SPI data to go back, fix the safety case, and fix whatever needs to be fixed so that you don't have a problem the next time you encounter that situation. It's easy to think that SPIs are just about monitoring dangerous behavior. Okay, an SPI monitors when the vehicle does something that's obviously wrong, but SPIs go beyond that. Acts dangerously is only one dimension. Sure, go ahead, look at the violation rate of pedestrian buffer zones. Passing too close to a pedestrian is a problem. Failing to stop at a stop sign is clearly a problem. Look at how often you're closer than you should be to the following distance of a vehicle in front of you. Those are sort of obvious ones. However, there are also components that need to meet their safety-related requirements. There may be a false negative or positive detection rate criteria on a certain set of sensors, and you need to be as good as you think you are, or else your safety case no longer makes sense. There's very likely to be a limit on correlated multi-sensor failure rates, and that may be very difficult to measure during design. You really want to know if you say, well, I'll detect people because I have three different sensor types, and then there's some sorts of clothing articles that make it so that none of the three sensors detect that person, that's going to be a problem, and you really need to know about that. And you need the feedback from SPIs to tell you what happened before you have a collision with a pedestrian. There are also design and life cycle considerations. You need to know whether your design process has a quality issue. You need to know whether your maintenance and inspections are being done on time and with sufficient quality. In short, if it's relevant to safety, it should be in your safety case. And if it's a claim in your safety case, to the maximum degree you can, you should be figuring out how to measure it and use that measurement as an SPI. Functionality is measured by KPIs. So functionality is, are all the features implemented? Does each feature work as intended? Those are great to have as KPIs, and you should definitely have those KPIs, but they're not necessarily directly linked to safety. You might also say, is testing progress on track per schedule? There's a great KPI for project risk, but it doesn't necessarily have that much to do with runtime safety. Runtime safety monitors take the system, they realize something bad's happening, and they trigger a risk reduction. Uh, looks like you're about to have a crash, we're gonna slam on the brakes. Looks like you're following someone too closely, we're gonna back off from that. You also need to have those. But just because you have a mechanism to reduce runtime risk doesn't mean there's no defect in your system. The SPI is more about finding out the defects in the system via the safety case and fixing them so your runtime monitor doesn't need to activate. So safety feedback by SPIs asks questions like, did the runtime safety monitor miss something? Are there dangerous gaps in the operational design domain that are causing the runtime monitor to trigger too often or that maybe the runtime monitor is not even designed to deal with? Are there problems with the requirements, design, upkeep, and so on? Are there dangerous gaps in the fault responses? 
So SPIs are about feedback at the design loop level rather than adaptation and feedback solely at runtime. There could easily be some things that are a KPI and also a trigger for runtime safety monitor and also an SPI. That's great. But the three concepts are fundamentally different. And any time when you see one that says all three, that's more of a coincidence than a fundamental property. As a very concrete example, let's look at following distance. Responsibility sensitive safety, RSS, is a set of math that helps you decide whether the vehicle is operating in a safe way according to good driving rules. The fundamental example given is following distance. If you know some physics, you can look at the acceleration, deceleration, and so on, and, and derive some math to say this is how far back you should follow from another vehicle, assuming braking capacity, assuming friction of the road surface, and all these other things, and you know what the safe following distance is. A KPI for this would be something like the average following distance. Are you following more or less about as far as you should most of the time? That's a great KPI because if that KPI says you're tailgating, you know you have a problem. But you can be a little more nuanced than that. A runtime monitor similarly would say, well, right now I'm following too closely. The KPI says 99% of the time at the right distance. Right now, here at this second, I'm too close. So I'm going to slam on the brakes to avoid a rear end collision in case the car in front of me should brake hard. OK, that's a great runtime monitor, and it can give you some operational safety. But that's not an SPI. The SPI might be, how often do I slam on the brakes because the runtime monitor is unhappy? But it should also have a more overall look. Is the situation more dangerous than expected? Am I spending too much time in traffic that's denser than I expected, and so my whole operational safety is misjudged because I didn't realize I'd be forced to tailgate by dense traffic? Am I seeing the lead vehicle panic braking all the time where my safety case assumed it would be a rare event? Am I seeing that I'm spending too long to recover, that I made some allowance that sometimes someone cutting in front of me would result in too close a following distance, and I figured I'd be able to get far enough away within five seconds, but it's taking me 10 seconds. Is that a big deal? Well, in any specific drive cycle, you know, maybe not, but overall, those statistics will probably catch up with you. So the SPIs look much more like a big picture, things aren't what I expected, rather than a runtime monitor, which is we have to react right now and here's what we're going to do. And a KPI, which is, yeah, seems to be generally doing what I thought it would do, but I'm not going to worry about the details of safety. So given that you have SPIs, a sketch of an autonomous vehicle safety argument might look like this. We think the AV is safe enough to deploy because we followed some industry safety standards. Our safety culture is robust. All the known hazards have been mitigated and the residual risk is at an acceptable level. The arrival rate of unknowns is low, so we're not seeing a lot of triggering events at runtime, and the SPIs are helping us know when something weird happened that wasn't accounted for in our safety case. And the safety case has good SPI coverage, so we know that there aren't huge parts of the safety case that we have no instrumentation on. SPIs also should usually detect unknowns without an actual crash. If SPIs are working the way they're supposed to, the entire safety case has instrumentation so you know if parts of your safety case have problems because the SPIs are telling you, but also because the SPIs are hopefully pretty effective down in the lower depths of the safety case, you're finding out you have issues well before you get to a crash or something like that. Now, SPIs can't prevent a crash entirely, but you can hope to play the odds in which the vast majority of issues are caught by SPIs before there's a chance to get really unlucky and have the crash. To do that, not only do you need good coverage, but you have to know that historically, you've been able to fix your system and mitigate unknowns before a likely reoccurrence. So you only need to see something once or twice or a few times before you fix it, rather than waiting until a crash investigation to tell you you have a problem. Wrapping up. Removing human drivers makes safety much harder for autonomous vehicles than for human-driven vehicles because humans are great at handling loose ends and dealing with surprises. Not perfect, but really remarkably good at compensating for all sorts of problems. In an autonomous vehicle, you're just not going to have that. So you need a couple things. Tactically, it's great to have a runtime safety monitor to respond to, to weird instances or problems and bring the vehicle to a safe state. But that alone won't do it. You need a way to know that you have problems before you're in a dangerous situation, hopefully, and a way to respond across the design cycle. 
And so strategically, the SPIs monitor not only individual vehicles, but look for trends across the fleet so that you can have feedback to make your system better. And you don't have to wait for a crash or a recall. This is not something you do once in a while. This is something you do every day as part of normal business. Field feedback on a daily basis is giving you a life cycle adaptation rather than waiting for a loss event, a crash to be in the newspaper headlines before you make a change. SPIs predict and monitor system safety and they give you a structured principled way to do that rather than just thinking up what can I measure and what can I do with it. The KPIs are how well do we drive, those are great to have, but the SPIs are how often are safety claims falsified. So sometimes they measure something dangerous happened in the real world. Sometimes they measure whether or not an assumption you made in the design has been violated. Sometimes they measure some sort of intermediate number that, well, it's supposed to be such and such a level and we're a little bit beyond that. Let's fix it before something bad happens. The idea is SPIs are supposed to detect safety problems before you have the crash the vast majority of the time. In other words, SPIs aren't about whether or not your vehicle is unsafe right this second. SPIs are much more about, well, you think you're a certain amount of safe because the safety case says that. And the SPIs are measuring, are you really as safe as you think you are? And if you want to get ahead of safety and have a safely deployed vehicle, you need to be proactive, and this is a way to do that. There's SPI guidance in ANSI UL 4600 Chapter 16 for more depth. And the big takeaway from this talk is that field feedback will be required for autonomous vehicle safety, but there's a principled way to do that, and that's by using SPIs tied to a safety case to provide a data-driven way to do lifecycle safety adaptation.